Hello and welcome to another episode of Coding Secrets. In this episode, I will be looking at Sega's lock-on technology that they used for the first time, and only time, for the game Sonic and Knuckles. Please note, this is only my understanding and interpretation of how this all worked. I may well have got some of this wrong, in which case I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments. And while you're there, please like and subscribe as you point out my faults. Okay, originally Sonic 3 was planned to include Knuckles as a playable character, as well as the stages found in Sonic and Knuckles. However, the need to release the game in a timely manner, as well as the hardware cost of 4 megabyte cartridges at the time, led Sega to decide to cut the game in two. The first half was released as Sonic 3, and the second half released around 8 months later as Sonic and Knuckles. Now, part of me wonders if this was actually the plan from the beginning, even though all available information points to the decision being made during development. The reason I wonder about it being planned from the start is that the lock-on technology the game uses isn't exactly quick and easy to design, develop and produce at short notice. Sticking new game data onto tried and tested ROMs is one thing, but the tech involved in lock-on is quite another. In any case, it's time to take a look at exactly what lock-on technology is. At the most basic level, lock-on technology is a special cartridge that has an extra port that allows the player to plug another cartridge into their copy of Sonic & Knuckles, and thereby add the data from that cartridge to their Sonic & Knuckles game. The Sonic & Knuckles game can then incorporate that data in whatever way it wants. So if you plug in Sonic 3, you now have both halves of the originally intended game accessible to the console, and so the game can be played how it was designed to in the first place. Okay, so how does it work? Well, the maximum size of cartridge a Sega Genesis can access is 4 megabytes. Technically, some later games could access more, but they did that using a clever bank switching method, which certainly came with some limitations. Anyhow, the Sonic & Knuckles game took a total of 2 megabytes of cartridge space, which left another 2 megabytes theoretically accessible by the machine. What the lock-on technology does is map any cartridge plugged into it into the spare 2 megabytes of memory, which allowed it to then be accessed by the Sonic & Knuckles game. It doesn't matter what the game plugged into it is, as long as it was 2 megabytes or less, that memory could then be accessed by Sonic & Knuckles. Now, some later games ended up being over 2 megabytes. If they were plugged in, only the second half of their memory was accessible. More on that later. So, when the game runs, the first thing it does is look at memory location 200100. The Sonic & Knuckles ROM takes up memory locations 0 to 1FFFFF, a total of 200000 in hexadecimal, which is 2048K or 2 megabytes. Sorry for all the hexadecimal stuff. So, location 200100 is the location 256 bytes into the cartridge plugged into the lock-on port, because 100 in hex is 256 in decimal. If we take a look at what's in that location, in a typical cartridge we can see that it's the word SEGA. SEGA used this location on every game ever used on a SEGA Genesis to make sure that the cartridge inserted was a genuine SEGA approved game. If the word SEGA wasn't there, the console wouldn't try and run the game. In fact, this location was the start of a block of information about the cartridge and was called the ROM header. So the lock-on technology checked this ROM header to make sure it was a genuine SEGA game. Once it had decided it was a valid game, it looked to see what valid game it was. It did this by checking the serial number at location 200180. The serial number was unique for every game. Here's the ROM header for Sonic 3. You can see the word SEGA at the start, and this location here contains the serial number. So if the serial number was GMMK1079-00, it knew the game that had been plugged in was Sonic 3. Here's the piece of Sonic & Knuckles code that has the list of serial numbers that the game was compatible with. You can see the 1079 code here. You can also see 31051 codes. These are how it checks for Sonic 2. The 0, 0, 0, 001 and 0, 02 are version numbers. Sonic 2 was released with different version numbers, so it needed all those listed here so it would work with every version of Sonic 2. So if Sonic 3 was inserted, the player could then play the originally intended complete game called Sonic 3 and Knuckles. However, if Sonic 2 was inserted, the player could then play Knuckles the Echidna in Sonic the Hedgehog 2, which is basically Sonic 2, but playing as Knuckles instead. If the cartridge inserted was valid but wasn't Sonic 2 or Sonic 3, then the game would display a no way screen. This might seem then that the only games that could work with this system are Sonic 2 and 3, but in fact, on the no way screen you could press buttons A, B and C all at the same time, it would then launch the special stage. As the special stage is launched, the game checks to see if the cartridge is Sonic 1 by checking for the serial number GM00001009-00. If it is, the player can access all levels of the special stage along with a unique password for every level number. 
If any other game is connected at that point, the game will play a single level of the special stage based on the serial number of the cartridge that is plugged in. Now I mentioned earlier that later cartridges that had more than 2 megabytes of memory only mapped memory above 2 megabytes into the lock-on space. This means that when the memory is checked, the game wouldn't find the Sega message at the right place in memory, and so would just play the normal Sonic & Knuckles game and ignore any add-on cartridge. There is, however, a clever exception to this. The Sega Classic cartridge is 4 megabytes, and they placed a copy of the Sonic the Hedgehog ROM header at location 200100 of their game. This meant that when it was plugged into Sonic & Knuckles, the second half of their cartridge containing the fake ROM header would be mapped into location 200100, causing Sonic & Knuckles to think that an original Sonic the Hedgehog game was plugged in and allowing the player to access all the special stage variations but using the Sega Classic cartridge. Now let's have a look inside the lock-on cartridge. Ok, so what are all these different chips for? Well this one is the 2 megabytes of ROM that contains the whole Sonic & Knuckles game. The slightly smaller chip is 256k of ROM that contains a special patch version of Sonic 2. The other three chips basically decide whether to map Sonic & Knuckles ROM to memory or the Sonic 2 patch ROM to memory based on what cartridge is plugged into the lock-on port. The game sets a special pulse on the cartridge port if it detects Sonic 2, and these chips notice this pulse and map the patch to the right place. Very clever. I'd imagine detecting Sonic 2 was a later addition, as it's a lot of hardware and a new ROM chip just to enable this, which is expensive. I'd have thought that they could have fit the Sonic 2 patch into the Sonic & Knuckles ROM if they'd planned it from the start and saved an awful lot of extra cost. So the lock-on technology was clever, but complicated, so was it worth it? Well, instead of delaying Sonic 3, which would have hurt sales, and having to ship it on a very expensive 4 megabyte cartridge, the lock-on solution meant they could instead ship Sonic 3 on time and on a 2 megabyte cartridge. And then 8 months later have a whole new game to sell, also on a 2 megabyte cartridge, which was, let's face it, basically genius. So that about does it for lock-on technology. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please consider subscribing. See you next time on Coding Secrets. Goodbye.